Bibles. What's that? Did somebody say something? Did I miss something? Then let's be quiet out there, okay? No remarks from the peanut gallery. Why don't you open up your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 24. My message this morning is a convenient season. A convenient season. Acts chapter 24. And we're going to read verses 24 through 26. So let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. we we'll find it. Acts chapter 24, beginning with verse 24. The Bible says, And after certain days, when Felix, the governor of Judea, came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him, bribe money. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. A convenient season. Father in heaven, we thank you for the infallible word of God. And Lord, you tell us in your pages of this blessed book, You've given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through these exceeding great and precious promises and principles. We can learn the truth of your word, will, and ways and apply them to our lives. Help us, O God, to do this. May your Holy Spirit be present here today. Anoint this preacher with feet of clay. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. You don't have to open the New Testament very far to find out, especially when you get into the book of Acts, That everywhere the Apostle Paul went preaching the gospel, he either incited a riot or a revival. That's what would break out. Either people were getting saved or they were arresting him and throwing him in jail. One or the other. But here Paul has been arrested in Jerusalem for preaching. And now they're sending him to Caesarea to stand trial before Felix the governor of Judea. Now let me tell you a little bit about Felix first. Because a lot of people read the scriptures and they don't understand much about him. Now, Felix was a very cruel and greedy. He was a profligate man. He was known as a great adulteress. Adulteress, excuse me. He married a Jewish. Her name was Drusilla, whose brother was King Agrippa. And that whole family, all of Drusilla's family, all of Agrippa's family, all of them, ladies and gentlemen, were morally and spiritually corrupt, and they were crooked. But according, or I should say from a human perspective anyways, Felix's life was really a success. You say, how's that possible, Pastor Joel? Do you know that God a lot of times blesses an unsaved profligate because the goodness of God is to lead men to repentance? And there's other times someone who's walking holy with God never gets blessed. Why? I don't know why, but I do know God says this, that our best life is yet to come. It's not your best life now like Joel Osteen's saying. But you see, beloved, he was born a slave, and then he was later freed, and eventually he ended up working his way to being governor of Judea. Now, I remember years ago reading the ancient Roman writer and historian Tacitus. I used to study him all the time. But anyways, he said this about Governor Felix, and I quote. He says, he practiced every form of cruelty and corruption, every form of barbarism and brutality, every form of sexual lust and perversion and crime imaginable. And then he went on to say also that Governor Felix exercised his royal power with the disposition and instincts of a crude, deranged, unprincipled slave that he formerly was. You know, someone just trying to get ahead no matter what the cost. And then he said and that he was a very mentally disturbed madman. He was a pervert. He was a murderer. Ladies and gentlemen, we know from history that few who ever stood before Felix never really got any real fairness. They never really got any real justice from his rulings. Indeed, his palace walls and floors had witnessed the brutality and all of the bloodshed of many that he had executed, and he had done it without mercy. I was reading about Felix, beloved, and they would say he would torture people just for the fun of it. And this is the man the Apostle Paul is for. So I want you to have that in your mind. And folks, his regal palace halls 
heard the echoing screams of those who writhed in pain and agony from the torture they suffered at his demented hands as he slowly put them to death. Not killing you right away, not just lopping off your head, not just crucifying you, but torturing you slowly. Maybe he'll break. Maybe he'll renounce Christ. Maybe he'll give it all up. I'll see what he can take. And so I'm saying that Governor Felix was not a very nice man. He was a cruel, hard tyrant. But today, beloved, those palace halls and walls are, uh, and all who attend this trial are going to hear a powerful sermon. And they're going to hear it from an innocent man. This man is an apostle. This man is an anointed man of God. This man is a prisoner and his name is the Apostle Paul. Would you say amen out there? Now I want you to picture this in your mind's eye. Governor Felix is now going to make a dramatic entrance into the courtroom with his entourage of servants. Here comes his servants and his wife Drusilla walking behind them. And then all of the other dignitaries, beloved. And you can see the musicians playing with noisy blasts of horn and trumpets blowing as Governor Felix kind of goes over and he sits down on his royal judgment seat. But then, beloved, when the music stops, then the Apostle Paul slowly He's a prisoner now, bound in shackles, silently enters the courtroom. And he too has an entourage. And if you look behind him, what do you see? You see a bunch of Roman guards and a bunch of, bunch of Roman soldiers with swords and spears escorting him in to sit right before Governor Felix. Would you say amen out there? But instead of trumpet blasts, instead of horns blowing, instead of a great noisy fanfare, beloved, his entry, all you can hear is the clinging and the clanging sound of the chains and manacles that uh, bind him, just rattling as he slowly moves and drags him across the floor. You can just see it, clank, 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 as he goes up before the judgment seat of Governor Felix, and he kind of stops, manacled, chained together. That's the kind of fanfare he had. And by the way, I, I, I'm sure when you notice that every five minutes, a Christian is killed somewhere in the world. Christians are the most persecuted people in all the world today. Of course, you don't hear the news media ever covering that, do you? They're leftists. But anyways, beloved, stay with me now, because there's something here that I want you to see. I want you to see a principle. Though by human standards, Paul is the prisoner who's physically bound in chains and Governor Felix is free, nevertheless, in reality, by divine standards, it's really the exact opposite that's true. You see, folks, Governor Felix, <coughs> excuse me, is the real prisoner here, and Paul is free. His soul, Governor Felix's soul, is now bound by the chains and the cords of his sin. And if he doesn't repent of those sins, he's going to split hell wide open. Whereas Paul is free before God. See, he's been forgiven already, beloved. He already has the gift of eternal life. So really, the roles are reversed here, isn't it? It isn't Governor Felix that's free, it's Paul who's free. Would you say amen out there? You see, Paul was inwardly and spiritually saved. He was a man that was forgiven by God, and I hope you are too. Because every one of us is one heartbeat and one breath away from meeting our maker. Would you say amen out there? But Governor Felix, conversely, he may be physically free, ladies and gentlemen, but his soul inwardly and spiritually chained you see, he's got the eternal death sentence hanging over his head like the proverbial sword of Damocles, and he doesn't even realize it, as most people don't in this world. Most people go about their business. I'm going to make money. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And they don't have a clue that in one heartbeat they will stand before God if they drop. And then they're going to have to give an account for their life. You say, I don't believe it. It makes no difference. No one can disprove this book, and we know that. Historically, archaeologically, scientifically, many men have tried it, and they got converted. Many lawyers who said, I know all about archaeology and, and law. I'm going to prove this Bible true, and they became preachers. Imagine that. You ought to look up Simon Greenleaf sometime. I don't have time to go there. But, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here is Governor Felix, though thinking he's free, he's deluded. Maybe have people say to you, what do you mean you're a Christian? You can't smoke, you can't drink. Not that I can't, I don't want to. I'm free. You have to. I can have a good time without having alcohol. You know that? I always raise heaven. I always have fun. My wife will tell you, I'm always joking around. My mother said to me when I became a preacher, she says, Joel, I always knew you'd go on TV. 
but I thought I was going to be a comedian. <laughs> she said, I thought I was going to be a comedian, not a preacher. <laughs> I'm a comic preacher, I guess. I don't know. So, beloved, he needed to get right with God. So I ask you, are you a prisoner both bound and free like Paul or are you bound and free like Governor Felix? Which one are you? As you're sitting right here today, and I want you to be honest and truthful with yourself, beloved. Are you trusting your religiosity to get you to heaven? If you are, then you're like a Governor Felix. You're not like a Paul. Maybe you're here today, listen to me, beloved, and you're trusting in your own good works. That's going to get me to heaven. You are like a Governor Felix and not like a Paul. Kids, listen to me now. Maybe you're here and you say, I'll go to heaven. Why? Because my mom and dad are Christians. That's not going to get you there. Or maybe your spouse, beloved. Maybe you're trusting in your church to get you to heaven. If you are, then you're like a governor Felix, and you are not like the Apostle Paul. Would you say amen? You say, Pastor Joel, how about if I trust in my pastor? Well, if it's me, it's okay. No, I'm only kidding. Hey, beloved, if you're trusting in your pastor, you're trusting in your priest, you're trusting in your rabbi, you're trusting in your pope, it means nothing. You're, you never get to heaven that way. The only way you're going to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? See, you're like a Governor Felix. You're not like the Apostle Paul. Listen, beloved, don't lose me now. I want to ask you, who or what is it that you're really trusting in to forgive you? You, from the penalty and the power of your sins and to get you to heaven. Don't you lose me. Do you really know if you're saved here today, that you are saved from the curse and the condemnation of God's law? Do you know that? Beloved, listen to me. Do you know for sure that if you're born again, that you're forgiven, that you are a child of God? Do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? Do you know for sure if you are a Felix or you are a Paul? Which one are you here? Which one can you identify with the most? I ask you that. I ask you to reflect on that. Think about that a second. A lot of people just think, well, you know what, I'm good enough. My father saved, my mother saved, my brother saved, I come to church. I... That means nothing, ladies and gentlemen. You see, Paul knew what it meant to be saved, amen, and he knew what it meant to be free. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. I sure hope and pray that you can say, yes, I know for sure I am saved. I'm washed in the blood. I am going to glory. I know that. You say, beloved, in our text, Paul stands before the one man, a despotic Governor Felix, who had the power right then to remove his chains and physically set him free. But I want you to notice something here in the text, if you would, beloved. Paul did not beg for his life or mercy, did he, when he went before Felix? Paul did not beg for his release or for his freedom, beloved. Paul knew that for a Christian to live is Christ and to die is gain. Would you say amen out there? Paul knew this, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You see, beloved, Paul knew this, that if he died a martyr's death, that he would now go to heaven and receive heavenly rewards. Would you say amen out there? He received the crown of eternal life, the incorruptible crown. So Paul's all confidence as he's standing before Governor Felix, whatever the Lord's will is in this, I'm for it. Yeah, in fact, he said to the Philippians, he says, listen, you know what, the department be with is far better, but it's necessary I hang around with you for a while. I don't want to, but it's necessary that I do. Okay, so Paul, beloved, he made no deals with Governor Felix. He made no agreements or promises to Governor Felix. Why? Because Paul had no fear of death, do you? He had no dread or terror of death. Do you have it? Beloved, those who know the Lord, the Bible says, God has taken the sting of death out of him. Would you say amen? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? Now stay with me, beloved. I want to talk to you a little bit more about Paul. Since his, conversion, since his baptism, beloved, Paul always knew that he was a dead man walking. Do you know that? You should know that. When I say you, my fingers point to you. Remember, three pointing back at me. We should all know that. That since we got saved, we're a dead man walking. And that's why he boldly said in Galatians 2.20, he said, I am crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. 
But Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm a dead man. I'm a walking dead man. In other words, beloved, what he's saying is that he was dead to himself. He was dead to this life. He was dead to this evil world system, but he was alive unto Christ. Would you say amen out there? So there was no way he was going to make any type of a deal with this crooked or corrupt and cruel Governor Felix that he was going to stand trial before, or even though Felix could have released him right then and there. Unlock him. He's an innocent man. Get him out of here. I don't want to waste my time with this man anymore. And he was an unjust judge, uh, by the way. So I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. You see, Paul understood something, beloved, that we need to. That when he stood before Felix, that the only thing that really mattered to Paul was the soul of Felix. He knew that this man was an unsaved man, and so therefore he knew that hell was real. He had seen the glorified, risen Christ. And Christ himself, beloved, had spoken so much about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. And Paul did not want to see Felix go to hell. So Paul was bold as he stood and he preached to this governor that could release him. I'll never forget one time, years ago, we had someone that was being locked up. And, and uh, little did we know that this person had sold the three drugs to the undercover knock. It was his third uh, offense and he could have spent 35 years in jail. And we went before a woman judge. And I went with this person, and the woman judge, who was known as a hanging judge, the uh, defense attorney said, Your Honor, can this pastor uh, um, say a few words? And God came on her. She says, Sure, Pastor. She was like my sister. Hi, so good to meet you, Joel. She says, Come on up here. Come right up here. And so I went up in front of the bench. And I got up in front of the bench. And she says, Take as long as you want. I says, Okay. I preached to the congregation. I turned around and preached to her. And I said to her, listen, Your Honor, he's not going to get any type of rehabilitation in jail. But if you leave him with me, you leave him here in church, we're going to shake the fire out of him. We'll get him right. <laughs> you know what she said? Three undercover knocks came in, covered, their head covered with a, with a black thing. And they said this. He sold three times. It was a mandatory 35 years. But then she says, preacher, my hands are tied. The law says he has to spend five years in a day, and I will make his sentences run concurrently. So instead of 35 years, he spent five years and one day, mandatory, amen? God had gotten a hold of that woman, and she now poured out mercy upon this person. And I'll tell you, uh, I kind of wish that she didn't, now looking back over the years. But be that as it may, beloved. The only thing that married to Paul, was whether or not Felix was a believer in Christ. I want you to look at verse 25. And it says, As he, Paul, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now our text says that Paul reasoned, dialogomai is the Greek word uh, with Governor Felix. Now that word dialogomai means that he very passionately preached and pleaded with him to get saved right now. Can you imagine doing that before the judge? Dialogomai, that Greek word literally means, beloved, to fervently argue and contend with Felix, to get him right with God right now. I, I know you can release me. That doesn't make any difference to me. You need to get right with God. Can you just see him? <laughs> I mean, this guy had some chutzpah, didn't he? That word dialogomai, beloved, that Greek word means to zealously and thoroughly discuss and speak about uh, Christ, letting Christ become his Savior and forgive his sins, to save his soul from hell, and to do it right now. Oh, please listen to me, beloved. The powerful gospel message Paul preached to Governor Felix was one of necessity. It was one of urgency and gravity. It was one of immediacy. It was one of great importance. It was one that every man, woman, and child on the top side of this earth needs to hear before they die. Would you say amen? Paul wasn't saying, I want you to get saved tomorrow. He wasn't saying next week. Paul was saying, I want you to get saved right now while the urgency is still on your heart. It's a necessity, O king. You see, beloved, what Paul was doing was giving him an ultimatum. Christ doesn't give us a choice or a challenge. He's not saying you can get saved if you want to or not. An ultimatum. Either die with me and go to heaven or die and split hell wide open for all eternity. It's an ultimatum that the gospel gives us. And it's good news and it's bad news. Good news, you can be forgiven no matter what you did. Bad news, if you reject it, you're going to split hell wide open. That's the bad news. 
The more light you turn around or turn from, the more you spurn that light, the more accountable and responsible you are for the information that you had. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, Governor Felix needed to accept Christ before it was too late, and the opportunity passed him by, and it will pass you by. It is God who takes the divine initiative in our salvation. He calls us by His Spirit and grace through the gospel. And if we don't listen when He's knocking on the doors of our heart, ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you, then the locks get softer and softer and softer, and that's it. And I don't mean just to get saved initially. I mean to stay saved in your walk with the Lord. Would you say amen? Oh, beloved, it required an immediate personal decision by Governor Felix that must not be delayed. It must not be delayed by you. It must not be postponed or put off. The same is true for you and I, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Behold, beloved, God offers you pardon not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not next year. He says, I give you my pardon today. Listen to what I have to say. Hear what the Spirit has to say unto the who are sitting in the churches, unto the people out there in the world who are reading my Bible or listening to a track or listening to a preacher on the radio. Hear what I have to say. That's what God is saying. You see, we take it for granted. Beloved, do you imagine if I said to you, I could give you a billion dollars right now. You know what? Give you the gospel. You better take the gospel because the billion dollars are going to save you from dying. You see, that billion dollars, beloved, death is a trump card in life. Why? Because of sin. And all the science in the world is going to reverse that. Until Christ comes and reverses the curse, men are going to die. You say, well, we've lived longer. Do you know, beloved, I don't, want, I don't have time to get into this, but I want to tell you. Let me tell you some statistics. Since the turn of the 20th century, man has lived six years longer than he normally did. But you know why? Infant mortality rate is low because we've learned how to take care of babies. We started washing our, washing our hands. And also because we can keep a person alive on a machine. I don't know about you, I'd rather die and go to glory. People are having their cryogenic, having their head cut off, so put it in the freezer, right? I gotta tell you, you gotta be demented to have that. And then in a hundred years, if they find out what you sew me under a nice body, I hope you put your head on backwards because you'll be in real trouble. But there's three things I want you to see here today, beloved, that I think we all need to understand them. The first thing I want you to see is this. Messenger Paul. The messenger Paul. The messenger, I could put my name in there, Joel. The messenger Tom. The messenger Katie. The messenger, uh, you two. <laughs> Phil and David, all right. Derek's no messenger, he's a judge. You will do it. <laughs> but I want you to see the messenger Paul. Look what he says in verse 28. It says, And he, Paul, reasoned with Governor Felix of righteousness. Then he says of temperance, and then notice what he says here. He says, and of judgment to come. Let me stop you there. The first thing I want to jump out to you is the fearlessness and the courage of the Apostle Paul as he preached, as he appealed to the despotic Governor Felix, ladies and gentlemen, who alone could set him free. Normally, you want to puff a guy up. You want to sweet talk him before he'll let you go, but not Paul. That's not what the Apostle Paul did, beloved. You see, Paul pulled no punches here. Paul minced no words. And the Bible says he reasoned with Governor Felix about three things. Let me talk to you briefly about them, but I don't have much time. Number one is righteousness. Diakone is the Greek word, and it means this, that he reasoned with him about the scriptural truths and doctrines of doing what is morally and spiritually right and pure and honest and just before God, or what is wrong, impure, immoral in God's sight. Yeah, Felix, this is right if you did it, but this is wrong if you don't. I want to tell you something. Do you think that would put you under conviction? You know, I, I, I know it would me, beloved. You see, Paul spoke about how a sinful man can only be justified before a holy God, how he can only be vindicated before a holy God only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can do it. There's no other way to be justified. You can't buy your way to heaven. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. You're a sinner that needs to be saved by grace. So Paul is saying, you want to be justified, O king? Then what you need to do is bow your name before the king of kings. That's what you need to do. That is righteousness. And you see, beloved, Felix understood it was a righteousness that he did not have. Ho, ho, ho. By the way, we don't either. 
Isaiah 64, 6 says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before our holy God. And that Hebrew word means filthy menstrual rags, filthy leprous rags. They used to take and burn in a pile. You see, you're being kind of crude, Pastor Joe. I'm telling you what the Bible says. That's what it means by filthy rags. Every man, there's no one that's good on this earth, beloved. And even the goodness you do before Christ, God says like a menstrual rag, a leprous rag, full of pus in my sight. See, we don't see how holy this God is, do we? And we've lost sight of that, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why Paul also exhorts, and he warns professing Christians who live like the devil's crowd. He says to them in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, he says, To awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not this knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. A lot of Christians sit in churches every week and they have preachers that tickle their ears. Oh, it's okay, don't worry about it, God loves you, you know, you're going to go to heaven. You may sin or whatever, but you know, you just won't get as many rewards. Beloved, that's not what the Bible teaches, listen to me now. See, that's what the ear ticklers at Corinth are saying. Paul says, awake to righteousness, wake up, listen to me. Is he speaking to unsaved people or, or Christians? He's speaking to the church, the Christians that are sitting in the pews there. At Corinth, he says, and I speak this to your shame. You should have known it by now. I preached to you long enough. I spent 18 long months with weeping and tears, teaching you day and night. And beloved, when the Bible says somebody preaches to you day and night with weeping and tears, that means that guy's serious, amen? He's serious. He may know something that you and I don't know. Well, I think we ought to listen to him. How about you? I think we ought to, ladies and gentlemen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said this in Matthew 5, 6. He said, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they should be filled. Oh, God of heaven and earth, teach me to obey thy law. Lord, I, I need to know your word. I need to understand it. Lord, give me the power to obey it. And God said, I'll fill you with my righteousness. I'll fill you with my power. I'll fill you with my grace. And you love to do it. You'll want to do it. You'll see how sinful this darkened world really is. It's abysmally, morally, and spiritually dark. Would you say amen out there? So Paul boldly reasoned with a powerful and tyrannical governor Felix, beloved, who alone could set him free about his lack of righteousness, about his lack of virtue and justice and morality. And you know, beloved, if you think back, maybe he was taking a cue from John the Baptist who stood before King Herod. And he says, thou art an adulterer. <laughs> and then his head was served to him on a platter because Herodias said, I want his head on a charger. He's convicted me too much. How can you let him preach to you like that? Look at him. Who are you eating bugs and honey out there in the wilderness? He doesn't even have a good wardrobe. But he was a man of God, wasn't he? The word of the Lord came unto John, the Bible said. I hope the word of the Lord comes unto you and comes unto me too. So the question is, is Paul also reasoning with you? Is he right now reasoning with you about your righteousness or your lack thereof? Oh, beloved, hear me now, hear me now. It's the Spirit of God who's speaking to this preacher, not just me. I'm preaching the Word to you, so the Spirit is anointing it. Is he speaking to you about your righteousness or your unrighteousness? So Paul spoke to him about righteousness. Secondly, beloved, he spoke to him about enkratia. What's that, Pastor? Temperance. Enkratia. And it means about moral and spiritual and physical self-control and self-restraint of one's inner passions and desires and the impulses of the heart. And to have mastery over your sensual bodily appetites in the flesh. Very few people can, they want to go do something, I have to do it. If it feels good, do it. No, that's not true. You know, you may feel good having a shark, like Brother Kenny did the other day. But it may be a shocking one that will kill you, too. <laughs> you see, beloved, self-control. Today we just said free, free. But let me tell you something. There's no freedom without laws. You said, I don't believe that. Drive down the highway. Let's take all the laws off the highway. See how you make out. Twice in my life, I was going, one time, I used to work at a government center uh, in Boston. I was going north. Uh, at, uh, oh, I forget it was, probably about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and I saw this car coming toward me, and I thought he was on the other side of the street. Guess what? He was on my side of the street. And I literally ran off the road, and I went between two trees, 
my door handle, I, I, I don't know how I fit in there. Only the Lord could have done it. And my, my, it took my uh, door handles off. The following week, a Friday night, I had worked until probably 12.30 at night. And I was coming out of Boston. There wasn't much traffic at all. Cruising down the highway, I had a, a, I'll never forget, a Mustang convertible. And I used to love that. <laughs> four, four speed, right? Coming down the highway. And all of a sudden, I see a car coming. And he runs me off the road in Duxbury. <laughs> He was coming south, excuse me, north on the southbound lane. Now, aren't you glad we got some laws on the highway? And because of those laws, you have freedom to drive anywhere you want. Well, it's the same way with God's laws. God's laws set us free. And when you're free, what did Jesus say? You're free indeed. Hear me now. God wants you to live a holy, righteous, and godly, self-controlled life. Paul said to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 6, verse 12, he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey the lusts thereof. Don't let it reign. You have the power to do it. You have the power to conquer it. You have the power to subdue it. You have the power to control it. But will you use it? Because God has given you this power. So, beloved, do you have self-control? I'm talking about self-control over your body. I'm talking about self-control over your fleshy appetites, over your passions, over your impulses and desires. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said this in Proverbs 23, 7. He said, put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. You're better off slitting your own throat than giving in to every kind of impulse there is. Put a knife to your throat, he said. Kill yourself. Why? Because the more I give in to my... The more sin I make, the more sin I make, the more I'm accountable to God, the more accountable to God, the farther in hell I'll go. Am I right? The Bible says men treasure up wrath unto the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Every day you're on this earth if you're apart from Christ. Your sins are piling up like Mount Vesuvius right now. So listen to me. Colin Felix was in bondage to his appetites. And Paul knew he was in bondage to his sensual desires and urges and impulses. The question is, are you like him or do you have self-control over your own life? I pray that you do and I pray that I do. I try to live a disciplined life. I really do, beloved. I really do. I found it has served me well over the years. But there's only one thing I know I can't do is diet. I have the seafood diet. I see food and I eat everything in front of me. (laughs) You know, beloved, Paul said this to the church of Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 4.3. He states this. Every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, his flesh, in sanctification and honor. It's not a matter, do I know I shouldn't fornicate? Of course I know I shouldn't fornicate. It isn't a matter, should I go out and get drunk? I know I shouldn't go out and get drunk. See, I must know that I have to possess my vessel, otherwise I'm going to pay. Hear me now. God wants us to exercise self-control over our body and over our lust and over our character and conduct uh, and over our life, ladies and gentlemen. And Paul wasn't preaching anything that he didn't practice. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He said, I keep under, that is, I keep under control my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest by any means I myself would also be a castaway, uh, in the Dokimos. I won't win the prize of the incorruptible crown of eternal life in this race I'm running. He said to the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, he says, I press, I press, I press for the mark, for the prize of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. Beloved, let me ask you something. What is that prize? It's the crown, the incorruptible crown of eternal life. Would you say amen? That's what that crown is all about. Oh, you need to keep it right before your eyes. You need to keep an eye always focused on it in your life. Amen? Not just these things that are before you. You see, beloved, Felix knew he was a notorious sinner, and he lacked virtually all of this. And he no doubt knew that he was guilty before God, for he was indeed an adulterer. Drusilla was his third wife, and he knew he was a murderer, and he knew he was a thief because he History tells us that the Bible, he used to take bribes, he would take money, pay off, kickbacks, anything to do with favor. Yeah, okay, here, yeah, under the table, take this, whatever. So you, do you think this man was convicted when Paul was standing before him? A holy man of God, beloved. I believe 
that the glory of God must have radiated out of this man and emanated out of this man. What do you think? But he didn't only preach to him about righteousness and temperance, beloved, but about cream of mellow. I didn't say cream is mellow. Cream of mellow is a Greek word. It means judgment to come. In other words, God's judicial and punitive verdict in ruling of either guilt or innocence of his and our moral and spiritual character and conduct both in this life here and hereafter on that great and terrible day of judgment by which all men will stand, beloved. We're all going to stand before that great tribunal, that bar of God, and we're going to have to give an answer of everything that we said or did in this life. All men are judgment bound. Now, you're either going to go there with Christ as an advocate to plead your case, or you're going to go there and stand all by yourself. Would you say amen out there? We're going to give an account of ourselves to God. The Bible says, Neither is any creature that is not manifest in his sight, for all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's Hebrews 4.13. That is with whom we have to give an account to. All things are naked unto him. We're talking about secret faults in Sabbath school this morning. There's no secret faults. Maybe in your conscience there is, but, and, uh, but uh, nobody else knows that. But I guarantee you, God knows it. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, when we stand before the judgment, then our eternal destiny will be forever. Not only given, but irreversible. In Hebrews 9, 27, it says, It is appointed unto all men once to die, but after this, the crisis, the crisis of the age, the judgment of God. That's what the word crisis means in the Greek. The judgment, the great crisis of standing before the judge of all the earth who knows all things, sees all things. That's the great judgment. Where would you be if you were to drop out of your body right now? And you never know what's going to happen. We've got Brother Eric today, just, just like that. And it could happen to anybody, couldn't it? You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you, Felix himself was an unjust judge. But now he was hearing that for the first time he was going to have to stand before an omniscient God who was divine and just and righteous and he was the judge of the universe someday and he was going to have to give a detailed account of what he did as God's minister and servant. He was a ruler. Romans 13 says rulers are God's ministers for judgment, for justice, for good. So every politician right now, we have grit down in Washington, D.C., but you know what? Every single one of those senators are going to stand before God and he's going to say, listen, you, did, you put partisanship before you ever put what was right before me before whatever was right for the people. This isn't about that. This is about doing what is right. I've appointed you. And I've allowed you to serve me. I'm a minister of spiritually. They're ministers secularly. And they're accountable to God also. Would you say amen out there? But you know, we're all going to stand before God. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says this, listen. For we must all, how much? all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the things that we've done in our body, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Every one of us is going to bow the knee to the Lord. You're either going to do it willingly or unwillingly, but you will bow the knee, and so won't I. You see, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, that is the terror of this coming day of judgment, he says, we persuade men like he did with Governor Felix here, hoping that he would bow the knee, that he'd say, you know what, you're right, Paul, I'm wrong, I need to get right. Paul says he was persuasive, knowing the terror of the Lord. Do you think Paul had insights about hell that we don't know? I do. I don't believe we could understand them because he was caught up to the third heaven and he heard things that were unspeakable and unlawful to utter. So we need to get a hold of that, ladies and gentlemen. You see, I think we need more bold preachers like Paul. What do you think? Preachers, ladies and gentlemen, are willing to speak the truth in spite of the possible threatenings or pain that may come upon them. Remember what the consequences are. But someone will say, listen, this is the way it is. And beloved, a lot of times when you're preaching, you get animated. You're not mad. You're preaching passionately and hopefully compassionately. But the fact of the matter is the message is true. And knowing the terror of the Lord. And that's the problem with men today. They don't have any fear of the Lord in them. They think they're their own God. So that's the messenger, Paul. Secondly, beloved, I want you to see the myopic procrastinator. Look what he says in verse 25b, and that would be Felix. The Bible says, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you notice how morally and spiritually blind, how morally and spiritually short-sighted he was, just like a lot of people are today? He was only focused on this life. He was not focused on the afterlife. How can I gratify and satisfy my flesh today? Tomorrow be darned. Isn't that the way a lot of folks live? You see, beloved, Paul didn't even look, think about that. When Paul stood before Felix, beloved, he put the fear of God into Felix. And consequently, the Bible says Felix trembled. Now, beloved, remember, this is the man that makes everybody else tremble. But now he's trembled. Now he's frightened. Now he's absolutely terrified. Why? Because he was under good old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. And only a preacher can put you under that who's anointed by God. He preaches the Word of God to the people of God, anointed by the Spirit of God. Would you say amen? Good old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. And that's what we all need. And that's what Felix, when he trembled when he thought about that. Boy, people could stand before me and I could send them to them to death. But me, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm an unjust judge and I'm going to stand before a just judge. And now he trembles. At least he trembled, by the way. You see, beloved, we need people today that will lift up God. We need preachers that will lift up God. Not a man-centered gospel, but a gospel that will show God in all that He is, high and lifted up. In other words, in all His awesome and terrible holiness and righteousness. In all of His awesome and terrible justice and power and majesty and dignity, beloved. In all of His glory and grandeur. We need men to be able to see like that, see God like that, so they'll tremble. They think God is a defanged, toothless tiger. He's just an old grandfather in the sky. He's a Santa Claus. Just do whatever you want. He'll forgive you whatever you want. He'll help you whatever you want. That's not true. That is the God of this world that they're painting. The picture this apostate church is painting today. That's not the God of the Bible. You see, he's a holy God. So holy he had to kill his son to pay for our sins. So, beloved, Felix was living a sinful life, diametrically opposed to what God demanded. And he knew that if Paul was right, and Jesus was indeed the very Son of God that he rejected, then he was certain that he was going to be condemned, he was going to be doomed, he was going to be damned for his sins, beloved. But now, now he hears the preaching of the Word of God, and his conscience was now awakened. Praise the Lord. You see, beloved, when you hear the preaching of the Word of God, he saw the guilt of his sins, of injustice, and the lack of self-control. And his mind was now filled with the awful and dreadful terror and horror of having to stand before this just judge on the day of judgment. And that's why we preach. That's what the gospel is supposed to do. It's supposed to shake you and rattle you and make you tremble, beloved. And then when you get saved, it soothes you. Amen? But it's supposed to make you shake. It's supposed to make you tremble. That's the Galleon. That's the Greek word for good news, gospel, in the New Testament. So Governor Felix trembled, beloved, but still he rejected Christ, and ultimately we know that he was damned and punished for his sins. Whereas, think about the Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas were in jail in the middle of the night. Not not supposed to be happy, but he sang with all his might. The Philippian jailer, what does he do? He trembles, the Bible said, but he got saved. What must I do to be saved? He runs and he falls down before the apostle Paul and Silas. What do I have to do? Whatever it is. He says, well, listen, you need to accept Jesus. Said, I do it. You need to be baptized. I'm in prison right now. It's all right. I'll let you out. Do you know that was a death sentence if a Roman soldier ever did that? He must have thought that was pretty important to do that, huh? He must have thought that was pretty important. He goes out and him and his whole house got baptized, uh, the Bible says. But at least that guy got saved, beloved. Listen to me. Listen to me now. That's why so many people, because they don't have any fear of God. No fear of the judgment of God. None. That's why so many people live so sinfully and carnally and worldly. And that's why they're so unfaithful to God, beloved. And they're so backslidden. You see, they do not have any fear of God. They think they're above judgment. That if they're good in their own eyes, they'll never be judged. That is not true. That's your deceitful heart and mind. The heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins to give unto every man according to his work and according to the fruit of his doing. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. God tries the heart, not you. You're not the judge. You're fallen like I am. 
Bible says every man does right in his own eyes, right? Well, they did this to me, so I did it to them. I mean, that's only right, isn't it? Whatever happened to pray for your enemies? I'm praying that they get the stone fall on them, a hailstone. It's a 300 pounds. And <laughs> oh, beloved. You see, I'm saying this, that his conscience was now awakened, wasn't he, beloved? And he's trembling. And we, uh, the more we tremble, like Governor Felix said, beloved, the more fear of the Lord do we have, and the more we repent of our besetting sins, and the more we straighten out our lives and we get right with God. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 says this, Work out your own salvation. How do I do it, Paul? He says, with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Both the will? Uh-huh. He's motivating you to will. He's giving you fire to will. And to do of good pleasure? Uh-huh. He's giving you the divine and supernatural power to enable you to be able to do it. It is God that worketh in you both the will and to do his good pleasure. But you must yield yourself to him. You must submit yourself to him. You must surrender yourself to him. Because he won't do anything against your will. He has the power to, but then it wouldn't be love, would it? Putting a gun to my wife's head saying, you will love me. She said, Joel, everybody loves you. I said, I know that, Elliot, but just pretend. No. But you say, but what kind of love would that be if I put a gun to her head? <laughs> Sometimes I have to do You do love me, don't you? <laughs> Where I comb my hair. But I want you to notice yet what Governor Felix said to Paul Beloved. Look at verse 25b. He said to Felix, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, beloved, this is amazing to me. Felix could not bear to hear any more from Paul, so he used the excuse to get rid of him. He said, Go thy way. Get out of here. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. Denoting just how little he really cared about his immortal soul or his eternal destiny in heaven or hell, like many other Felixes in the world and in the church who lose their sight of this. There's a lot of Felixes in the church, I'll tell you right now. They're stuck at the new birth, and they think that's it. And that's not it. That's the beginning of your race. How you running? How you running, Felix? You see, beloved, I want you to know Felix's haughty and prideful attitude and spirit. And just like most of the folks, he thought he was in charge of his salvation and he could get saved any time that best suited him and fit into his schedule. He said, when I have time, when I have a convenient season, when I shall call for you. You know, he was like Frank Sinatra's song in Matra saying, I did it my way, I'm going to do it my way. It's either God's way, no way, or the highway. That's what the Bible teaches, right, in the byway. Now that may sound, so, and it appeals to our flesh, I did it my way, it's because of our pride. Do it your way, keep doing it your way, see what happens. Whatever you sow, you reap. Isn't that the law of reciprocity? But notice the words, beloved. He says this, a convenient season, that Greek word is kairos. And it means that Governor Felix was saying that when I have a suitable and appropriate, and I have an opportune time that I feel that is right for me, that does fit into my schedule, then I am going to call you, Paul, and I'll talk to you about me getting saved. In other words, who is sitting on the throne of his heart? God or him? Who's sitting on the throne of your heart, God or self? Who is sovereign over your life? I ask you here this morning, oh, beloved, listen to me. Unfortunately, many folks react like this to God's urgent call and word in their life. And they have the same attitude and problem as Governor Felix. In other words, beloved, we too say to those who may come to us to try to get us saved, give us the gospel, or restore us because we're in a backslidden situation. Go that way. Get, get out of here. I'll talk to you later about that. You see where we just readily dismiss that? And yet, beloved, let me ask you something. Do you think God may be using that person to plead with you and appeal to you? Do you think so? Do you think God is using this preacher right now to appeal to your conscience? Those watching on TV, those who will get the CD, those who will get the DVD, do you think he might be doing it? I had a woman one time, I was in my backyard, my front yard, excuse me, and uh, I didn't know this, but somebody had given her some of my CDs. And so she was driving down Clifton Street toward my house. She saw me in the front yard. She 
said, I kept hearing this. And she was listening to my tapes. And so she pulled over, and she went and looked at her car. She opened up her trunk, see if something was wrong, went underneath, got back in the car, started driving down the road. And then it dawned on her, it was me hitting the pump. <laughs> so she drives by me, right? And I saw her. Then she backs up. She says, you got a preacher on TV? I says, why? You like him? I want to know what preacher. She goes, yeah. She goes, I've got to tell you this. She says, I thought I saw Oh, my God. She says, I kept hearing the pounding. It was you hitting the pulpit. <laughs> she ran, you're going down the road. Thunk, thunk, thunk. <laughs> you see, beloved, I had gotten into it. And that's what you have to do. You have to abandon yourself and preach the truth. Amen? Because I believe it's true. Now hear me. The words of convenient season denote the utter moral and spiritual deception of our hearts. The words a convenient season denote the great danger of procrastination and always putting off things till later that we know must be done right now. The words of convenient season denote sheer blindness, beloved, and short-sightedness regarding the important decisions and choices in life that we know we need to make right now, but we, rep- we postpone them till later, and we'll say, I'll have plenty of time to do that. So we procrastinate. I'm saying a convenient season implies our procrastination, our postponing, our delaying, our stalling, our putting off of the urgent matters. Beloved, imagine, uh, it implies foolishness and folly, shelving and deferring very important things till a future date that we know that I must do right now. But I've got plenty of time. Proverbs 27.1 the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Hey, listen to me. Perfect example we had in Sabbath school. You think Eric thought he was going to faint like that? Like us, we thought we were just going to come to church. How do you know what's going to happen to you? None of us know, do we? And just like that, beloved, it could be over for you and I. <clears throat> just like that. And I, th- I was thinking that as I was praying between the services. I was praying for him, and I was saying, Lord, Teach us to number our days. Teach us. Teach me, oh God. I, I know I, my wife would tell you that this is like we're on a marathon. When you're my age and you're preaching up here, your heart's pounding a thousand miles an hour. I remember Cheryl one day, she came up and she took my, my blood pressure after I, I my blood pressure is usually, I thank the Lord, it's really pretty good, 105, 106, over 64, and usually pretty good. My blood pressure that day was 145 over 95. My heartbeat was 120. I just got through preaching. And she says, Pastor, your blood pressure's up. I said, Cheryl, I just got through preaching. It's not like I'm uh, just sitting here, you know what I'm saying? I did, I did memory verse. I did morning service. I've done this, and I got a counsel. So your heart goes like crazy. You wish you could get rid of me that easy. I'm going to live to 141. I've been fresh and tailored. I have no hair on my head, no teeth in my mouth. Don't know. <laughs> Told you I'm an Indian. I got a wig on. I keep it in the oven and keep my wig warm. I'll oh, forget it. We read this morning, James chapter 4, verse 14. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then what? Say it. Poof! Vanisheth away, isn't it? Like the steam coming out of the kettle. You're going to have a cup of tea, and you see it going up. The condensation, it just evaporates. What is your life? It's a vapor. That's all it is, ladies and gentlemen. You listen to me. God does not promise you another second, another minute, another hour, another day, another month, another year, another tomorrow. Life is short when it's compared to eternity, beloved, even though you think you have lots of time to get right with God. But did you know the statisticians tell us, now listen to me, this is a fact, that with every tick of the clock, someone dies somewhere in the world, and I may add, and they now slip out of their body and they stand before their maker. Now is the crisis, the crisis of the age, when they must give an account for everything that they've done. So, beloved, I ask you, are you like Governor Felix? Are you also a procrastinator or a postponer? Are you a delayer? 
who always puts things off because you think I have plenty of time to finish that project I started months ago. I have plenty of time to believe in Jesus. I have plenty of time to tend to my soul. I have plenty of time to secure my eternal destiny in heaven or hell. I have plenty of time to live it up now and sow my wild oats before Jesus comes back. Then I'll get serious with God. No, you don't, and no, you won't. Governor Felix didn't. No, you won't, and no, you don't. You don't have that kind of time, and neither do I. You see, ladies and gentlemen, his convenient season never came again. And yours and mine might not either. Beloved, don't listen to the devil's deception and lies. Today is your convenient season to get saved and baptized, not tomorrow. Today is your convenient season to get right with God, not tomorrow. Today is your convenient season to repent or be faithful or, or, or be faithful to church beloved to serve the Lord not tomorrow not next year not next month right now see today today is the day now is the time the Bible says doesn't it today is the day so many people think they get so much time well it'll be just like tomorrow I'll wake up nothing to do whatever and then tomorrow you wake up in the hospital with all kinds of tubes going in and out of you You see, beloved, your tomorrow's convenient season may never come in your life. So today is your convenient season. You know, I was thinking uh, proverbially speaking, you know the old timers used to say, he who hesitates is what? Lost. The old timers used to say this, beloved, it's the oily boy that catches the worm. We say today, you snooze, you lose. You know, there's a biblical principle somewhere intertwined with all that. So, beloved, there's really no convenient time to get saved and sanctified because when you're under conviction, nothing's convenient. There is no convenient time, beloved, to repent or be restored with God. It's always when you're in the midst of something. Amen, beloved, listen to me. Life consumes us, and it's... It presses us with duties and responsibilities and missed opportunities, and it fills us up, and we get so many things going, and someone comes and gets in our face and tells us we need to get right with God. Is that convenient? Is it? No, it's not convenient. It's never convenient. So there is really no convenient time except right now to get right with God. You see, beloved, so make today the present moment your convenient time. And thirdly, and I'll close with this, I hit the timer here, but notice I forgot to hit the button, so I still got 46 minutes. <laughs> so I'll just kind of ramble on. Well, beloved, we've seen the messenger Paul. We've seen the myopic procrastinator, which a lot of people are. But thirdly, I want you to see the mercenary plan. This is what was going to Governor Felix's mind. Paul's preaching to him. He's under conviction. And it says this in verse 26. He, Felix, hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. Beloved, by now Felix's heart was pounding, and he must have had a lump in his throat. What do you think? He knew that his moral and spiritual conduct was sinful, beloved. He knew that his life was far out of control. He knew that the day of judgment awaited him, but procrastination got the best of him and forever stole that convenient season that he had in his life to get saved. You hear me now? Procrastination is one of man's chiefest perils in life. Beloved, it is the thief of time. It is self-deception of the heart and it is satanic delusion. And it makes us think we got all kinds of excuses we can delay and postpone our salvation, or we got better times to do it. And sometime in the distant future, I can get right with God when I, when I, after I've had my fun and I get a little bit older. But let me tell you something. That means that callus on your heart will get thicker. I was telling someone this week, the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life as a minister, and it's been a lot of years, beloved, is try to restore a backslider. A person who knows, you see, beloved, getting out of the spiritual battle and getting back into it is a tough thing. And when you're out there living in sin, and sin is fun for a season, but it has eternal consequences. And then getting back into it, now I've got to discipline myself, I've got to control myself. Well, I want to tell you something, beloved, it's hard. 
And I can't count. I could probably count all my in one hand the, the amount of backsliders I've seen be restored. And I have pled with them. I have begged them. I have visited them one, one night a year, one night a week for a year. I have gone and begged and begged and begged, and they never came back. I've called them. I still pray for them. My list is so long of backsliders, it's unbelievable. And I pray that God restores them. You see, we think we can get our life right whenever we choose, and that's a delusion. That's a satanic lie that comes right out of the pit of hell, and it even smells like smoke. Because it is God who is in charge of everything. You see, Felix, beloved, oh, if he could have only seen that the urgent appeal and time to be saved was the very moment Paul stood before him and he preached to him. Now think about it, beloved. Sure, he had money. And he had wealth. And he had a young, beautiful wife. And he had prestige and power and and, uh, position, beloved. And he must have felt safe and secure. Yet Romans 2.5 warns this. It says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, thou treasurest up wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So what does Paul go on to say? Flee from the wrath to come. The righteous revelation of God. Oh, I thought I was doing so good. And God said, you want to see what righteousness is? Look at Jesus. You that good? Uh Uh-uh. Well, if you want his righteousness, you better come to me. So I can impute it to you. And then I'll implant it in you. And then you'll become individually righteous. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, Governor Felix let his convenience seize him, pass him by. Why did he do that? Because he knew this. Now listen. Paul had taken up a collection from all of the Gentile churches. And he came with huge bags of money into Jerusalem to the poor church of Jerusalem. And Felix said, I can get some of that money. I'll get my hands on that. I'll bring him before me. I'll let him talk all that he wants. And hopefully he'll offer me a bribe. See, I'm going to get some money out of this. This isn't for naught right now. Ah, he put a burr in my saddle. Yes, he's convicted me. Yes, he's made me feel awful. But that jingling-a-ling is going to sing real good. See, he was well aware. Everybody knew that Paul had gotten converted. Remember, he was the chief rabbi. So, Bill Edward, what am I saying to you? I'm saying Felix sold justice for greed. Felix sold fairness and righteousness and his salvation and his soul in heaven for greed. And instead, ladies and gentlemen, he chose an eternity in hell for money and wealth and bribes and politics and payoffs. Jesus said, what good is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? And then he adds, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you give if God put you by the nap of the neck on the threshold of hell and said, what would you give me to get out of here? What would you give him? God says, there's nothing you can give me. The only thing you can do is just what I did for you and I have given to you. Amen? Well, how do I show it, Lord? I'm faithful. How do I show it, Lord? I obey his commandments. Then I show I love him. Amen? Imagine your spouse saying to you, I love you, honey. I love you like a hog loves a slop. But she doesn't kiss me. And she doesn't eye my clothes. She doesn't support me. She doesn't, <laughs> no, what kind of love is that? She doesn't say hi to me when I come in the house. She doesn't say good night, honey bunny. And I've got to say that for my wife. I tiptoe because I let her take the shower first, right? And then I come out. And she's laying there. Like an angel, my, she's, my little angel. She's always up in the air about something. I read my Bible. Click. Uh-uh. Soon that light goes on. Uh-uh. I need my kiss good night. I said, oh, man. <laughs> I'm trying to slide by. <laughs> so I muckle right on to her. <laughs> we, we, we got a bed, right? We, we had to go and get a bed. Our, our bed was older than Methuselah. And so the guy talked me into getting one of these things that has buttons that comes up and down or whatever. Now, I didn't know this until afterwards, but you can get two beds that fit into a king-size bed where the, each person can operate their side independent. It doesn't affect the other person. I'll close with this. So I was laying 
bed one night, my back's throbbing and killing me, right? And I, I try to adjust myself. And so I went like this. And my, my head started coming up like this here. And I watched Ellie go. <laughs> I said, good night, honey. <laughs> every Sunday night, every Sunday night, every Sunday night, I tell you this is the truth. I'm not preaching now. <laughs> I lay down in bed, I'm like this. <laughs> Ellie says, I forgot to tell you, but I put the bed down. <laughs> you got to put it up, Joel. I said, hold on. <laughs> you know, beloved, when you look into the churches, the halls of justice today, even our government, our courts, our churches, so many people are seeking wealth and greed and power and 1 Timothy 6.10 says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. You can have money. You can't have money have you. So I want to ask you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, are you like Governor Felix? Will you let your conveniences and pass you by like he did? What will you sell your soul and your convenient season for? A good time? The world? titillating your flesh, or for nothing. I hope you can say, nothing, preacher. I'm not. I know I need to get right right now. I know I need to get saved right now. I know I need to be faithful right now. I know this moment comes forever. A convenient season. Remember Governor Felix. A convenient season. Let's go to the...